Thank you for being here tonight. And hope that you'll take your Bible and follow very closely. This is a very, very important lesson that we all need to examine. And I trust that we're doing so in the fear of God and that we understand the gravity of our situation as we open the pages of His Word that God is looking on. Some things that we always need to be checking, and that is our relationship to God and checking our relationship to the faith that He's delivered to us. That is, how do we look into God at this point in our spiritual life? And so I want us to take our Bible and turn to Ephesians chapter 4 and look there just a moment. I want us to understand what God is looking for and what He wants and then see if where we are in relationship to that. Ephesians 4, look at verse 13. He had already talked about God giving gifts such as apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. And that was to equip the saints, to give the saints something that equips them for the work of ministry and for the edifying to build up the body of Christ. And so we have to ask ourselves, are we involved in the work of ministry? That is, do we minister the gospel to other people? Do we minister to the needs of the saints? And do we edify, that is, try to build up the body, the church of Christ? Now, he gave these gifts for the purpose of, of equipping us till we come to the unity of of the faith, verse 13, and until we come to the knowledge of the Son of God, till we come to a perfect man, some versions may say complete, some versions may say mature man, that is, he's looking for us to grow and develop into perfection or maturity. Now notice this last phrase, to the measure of of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So what we are after and what the Lord is after in giving us these particular things that equip us is to help us grow into maturity and our measure that we're trying to reach is the stature of of the fullness of Christ. That means that we become as close to being like Jesus as is humanly possible. How do we get there? Well, we start as infants and we take in the sincere milk of the word and we start developing a a basic knowledge from that. But we keep on letting those who have, uh, whom God has equipped the church to continue to feed and help us to grow and look at ourselves until we are measuring ourselves by Jesus Christ and we see where we are and where we need to go. We start by, by measuring our faith. Now, in just a little bit, we will look at a verse in the book of Hebrews that talks about the full assurance of faith. Meanwhile, I want us to look at some things that tell us why we might not be there yet. And hopefully we will be prodded to become more like what God wants us to be. So I'm asking the question, at what level is your faith. Where is it at? Has it stagnated? Has it become, did you, were you baptized and then were happy for a while and then you let the cares of the world choke it out and you're not very uh, stable, not very strong, not very joyful, not very uh, 
excited about your faith, not very full of certainty. You see, those are things that tell us something about our faith. And this is very important. Jesus will talk about different levels of faith throughout his ministry. And you'll find that throughout the New Testament as well. And the first level of faith that I'd like us to see Jesus addressing is that level where he says, O ye of little faith. For example, in the scripture before you, in Matthew 6, verse 30, he talks about not worrying and not being so fearful about what we will eat or what we will drink. Fearful about material things because... The Father knows that we have need of these things. And since he clothes the grass of the field, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? So Jesus describes people who are worried about things in this world, worried about things in this life, to the point that it makes them miserable. That is little faith. And he is addressing that saying it is a little faith, and you need to to get more faith than that. A little faith is just enough to make you miserable. In James 1, verse 2 and 3, James talks about the trying of your faith, and that the trying of your faith can work stability or it can work patience. And then he goes on to talk about somebody who is double-minded. He can't see the wisdom of counting things joyfully that happen in his life. He doesn't count it all joy simply because he's double-minded. He has a little faith, but it's, it makes enough room for another mind, and that's a worldly mindset. So he doesn't see things like he needs to. Because he has little faith. He, he does not exercise his faith like he should. And so there is that double mindedness because we've got room to think two ways instead of one way. Instead of thinking how this will help us in our relationship to God, we're, uh, we're, uh, we're, we're engaging the pity party where we are always uh, pitiful about ourselves and our circumstances. And, and we can't see that the challenges to our faith is only going to make us stronger. That's double-mindedness. And then in Matthew chapter 8, verse 26, you see Jesus again talking to his disciples and saying what, uh, to, uh, for example, Peter as he was sinking in the water. When he stepped out of the boat to go to Jesus and the storm that he was seeing got his attention off of Jesus. And then he began to sink and Jesus says, why were you fearful, O ye of little faith? You see, he had room in his faith to let the storms crowd out his faith. And if you've made room for storms to crowd your faith out... Your faith is too small. And I have to ask myself, when that's happening to me, I have to always ask myself, well, where is your faith? What good is it doing you now? What good is it your faith doing you when you're allowing these kinds of things to crowd out your confidence in the Lord and his promises? If you've got a lot of room for worry and fear, you must not have a lot of faith. And so we have to ask ourselves that. Or in chapter 14, same thing with Peter. Same thing he said in, uh, to his disciples. Why did you fear? It seems to me that when the Lord says, I will never leave you, that we ought to believe that. But when we're in that stormy situation, it seems that we forget that. Why are we forgetting it just because a storm is there? Just because we're dealing with some difficulty? Well, it's because our faith is too small. 
we've made room for just the thought of the Lord's provision, but we do not grab hold of his promises when we need it. When we certainly need to be thinking about his promises, we just shove them to the back as we deal with the problems when we're dealing with. Oh, ye of little faith. I can hear the Lord saying that to me even now. Let that ring in your mind. If things are so troubling to you that you have forgotten and you no longer have room to believe that the Lord says, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age, that that's a permanency. And what happens to you and what happens to me does not in any way affect the certainty of God's promise. Now, we may be uncertain about applying it, but it is there and is just as strong now as it ever was. The problem is our faith is just too little. We don't believe it. At least we don't utilize it. We don't think about it. We're thinking about the storms all around us. And we've made room to let that storm crowd out any, any kind of degree of faith in the Lord's provisions and his promises. Sometimes our faith is too little to forgive ourselves when we ask the Lord to forgive us. And that's a big problem. I've seen many times in counseling some br brother or sister that they're just so uncertain about whether they can, they can make it to heaven, that they just don't have the certainty that they can. And what is that but just a lack of faith? We, we're not believing what Jesus died to give us. He was dying to give us that, and then we say, well, maybe for everybody else, but I'm not worthy of that. Jesus didn't say, you're worthy of it. We would never be worthy of it. But our faith does not give us room. It, it makes too much room for doubt. It makes a lot of room for uncertainty. But it makes no room for believing the provisions of God when we need to be certain about his provisions. That he loved me and he gave himself for me. Brethren, I think this is a real real problem that we face and that is the Lord would look at us many times and he would say shake his head say oh ye of little faith why did you doubt we have room for doubt we've made room for doubt but we did not make room for the confidence and the certainty and the assurance that the Lord wants us to have. So that's one measure. It's little and it's just enough to keep us miserable instead of happy and confident and content and full of assurance. Then the Bible also describes brothers and sisters. Romans 14 that we have to deal with brothers and sisters in Christ who have not developed their conscience like they need to. And so in Romans 14, 1, he describes brothers and sisters who, whose faith does not allow them to eat all kinds of meat. That is, they're still on the old program. Their mind has not allowed them to to proceed into the full liberty that is in Christ Jesus. And so if they grew up where you couldn't eat pork, you couldn't eat swine, that that was considered unclean, then their conscience stays behind when the brethren began to realize their full liberty in Jesus Christ. And so we've got to be considerate of the weak consciences of our of our brethren. Why is their conscience weak? Because their faith has not allowed them to grow to, the, to, to develop the liberty of conscience that they need. And so there is that level of faith. 
This faith remains uninformed for a while at least. And where, where the conscience is not adequately informed, the faith does not allow one to experience the full liberty that is in Christ Jesus. Then the Bible talks about empty faith. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14, turn with me there. Listen to Paul in this great chapter about the certainty of the gospel. And that's the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives us the certainty that the gospel is true and it gives us the certainty of the afterlife, the world that is to come. But some brethren got in there and got to uh, tinkering with the idea of that, well, what if, your, what if your body disintegrated? And where your ashes were strewn all over the ocean, God, that, that would be difficult to imagine God raising all of those bodies. And Paul says it's no more difficult to raise that body than it was to raise Jesus' body. And, Je and God did raise that body. But notice his statement in chapter 15, verse 14. He says, if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is vain. It's empty. It's not substantial. And your faith is also vain. Which means that you can have a faith, but it's not based on anything substantial. Now, we don't need that kind of faith because that faith will not do us any good in the moment of trial and difficulty. We've got to have a faith that's based on certainty. And it's got to be based on something substantial. And he says the substantial issue is Jesus was raised from the dead. And he was seen alive over a period of 40 days. That's substantial. His body was in, uh, missing from the tomb as we sung a while ago. And that's the reason I can face tomorrow is because I know that it is substantial. Now, if you've got an empty faith that's just based on wishful thinking or it based on mama said it was so or daddy said, but you didn't study it for yourself and you have not come to that conviction on your own, then you've got to empty. I mean, it's no better than the faith of the Hindu who believes what he believes, but it's not based on anything substantial or the, or the Islamic people who believe in Muhammad, but that's not based on anything substantial. We've got to have a faith that's based on something substantial. And that substantial item that brings us confidence is the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And you've studied it for yourself. And that's the thing upon which you have based your faith and that's wherein you stand. Also in, second, uh, first, in the second chapter uh, Paul makes this comment. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 5. He says that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Your faith needs to be in something substantial. The wisdom of man is not substantial. So don't trust in somebody else to do all the studying for you and, and all the... Uh, examination of evidence that brings you to your own faith. You've got to study it yourself. And it can't be based upon the wisdom of brother so-and-so. It's got to be based on the power of God. Otherwise, you'll walk around in life with an empty vessel, an empty faith. And we do not need that. And so again, we've gone from empty Nothing substantial, something weak, and something very little. But then there's something else. Jesus talks about people. These are human beings. Sometimes we think the ideal is Jesus, and that is so. Jesus had perfect faith. And Jesus Christ lived perfectly. 
But Jesus complimented people. He criticized the level of faith on occasion, but he also complimented the level of faith. Look, for example, in Matthew chapter 15, and this is just one of several examples, but look at this. Matthew 15, and uh, drop down to verse 28. This woman... wanted her daughter healed. And she came begging the Lord's help. And she, she said, Lord, help me, verse 25. And she wasn't even a Jew. She was from another nationality. Well... The Lord says it's not good to take the children's crumb, meaning the things that belong to the Jews, and throw it to the little dogs, those who are not in that circle. And she said, I recognize that, Lord. I am a little dog. True, Lord. Yet... Even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And so you've got plenty that you could share even with a little dog. And then Jesus said this. He answered and said to her, O oh woman, great is your faith. In other words, I've, I've been wanting to find some people in the Jews, among the Jews who had the kind of faith that you have. And you're demonstrating the kind of faith I've been looking for. Great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Great faith. Well, there are lots of different characteristics that you can think of that are associated with somebody exercising great faith. For example, Galatians 5, after talking about the difference between works of the law of Moses and faith in Jesus Christ, talks about that our faith is the kind that works. It's a faith that works through love. That we love people and we, we work because we love people. And we work because we have faith in God. And that's what God wants us to do. It is a faith that works through love. James would talk about Little faith. We need to talk about if you, if you see that this person, this brother is in need and you just say, go be warmed and filled. And you do not do anything. Then you do not have the faith that drives you to action. That's working. Do something if you have faith. Great faith drives us to work. Little faith would prevent us from working. It would hinder us from action and from work. James uh, goes on to talk about that faith without works is dead. It's useless. And he's matching the same idea that the book of Romans gives at the start, the middle, and the end. Romans 1.5, for example, talks about the obedience of the faith. In chapter 6, at the very end of the book, he'll talk about obedience of faith again. But in the very center, in chapter 6, he'll talk about that you have obeyed that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And you were then made free from sin. And you became servants of right. What do servants do? They work. You work what is right. You do what is right. The whole book of Romans is not telling us you, that all you've got to have is, a, is just some form of faith, but it's got to be an obedient faith. And that's great faith. When you are brought to the, to the realization that your faith must move you or it's no good, it is a worthless faith if it does not move us to, to grow and develop and to put our confidence in the Lord and less in ourselves and less in our circumstances. Then we can see great faith developing and making a big difference in us. 
Look at Ephesians 3. I like the terminology here, so I want you to look at that. Look at Ephesians 3, verse 12. Ephesians 3, verse 12 says, talking about Jesus, Christ Jesus our Lord, verse 11. Verse 12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. I mean, it's there for any of us to have access to him through faith. Access with confidence through faith in him. Well, if we don't do that, if we do not access him on a continual basis, then what we're doing to ourselves is we're emptying. We're just making too much room in our hearts and in our minds for doubt. And doubt will destroy us. We need to think in terms, does my faith give me confidence? Do I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ confidently? And when I ask for forgiveness of my sins, do I believe that he is faithful to forgive me? Access with confidence through faith in him. Then look over in Philippians Looking in Philippians chapter 1, look at this phrase. Philippians 1.25. He says here, And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith. Here are two things that you need to see here. There needs to be progress in our faith. If you're not making any progress, your faith is too small. And there's got to be joy in faith. If it doesn't give you satisfaction, if it doesn't put a smile in your heart and on your face, then something is wrong with the size, the measure of our faith. And so there needs to be great faith that gives us progress and joy, happiness. Otherwise, there's something missing. We are filled too much with emptiness and other things crowding out the power and the fullness of faith in Jesus Christ. Look in chapter 2. Verse 17 of Philippians. Philippians 2.17. Paul speaks again this way. Instead of progress and joy of faith, listen to this. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. There ought to be sacrificial things going on because our faith drives us. To be sacrificial people who serve. That's because it is a great faith. It's, we've made more room for faith than we've allowed anything else. It needs to crowd out everything. You know, we get caught up in what's happening in our world and especially this political season. Now, I'm, I'm very concerned about the future of our country. But faith needs to be greater than fear. And it needs to be overwhelmingly confident that the Lord will be with us even if the political winds change and, dry, and go in a terrible direction. We're still anchored in our faith in Jesus Christ. In Colossians 2, or 1 verse 23... He's praying that the brethren of Colossae would be grounded, continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Being grounded in our faith so that we are anchored tightly and strongly 
And so when the winds blow and beat upon our, our mental and spiritual house, it still stands through the storm. Grounded and steadfast in the faith. That's what we need to be making sure of. We don't want little faith. We need great faith. And we need the, to believe that the Lord is saying, Oh, great, I've not seen such great faith as this. No, not in Israel. Great faith. That's the kind of faith that gives us great satisfaction. But then finally, I'd like us to think in terms of that expression that we read in the reading just a moment ago. And that is full assurance of faith. First of all, we need to be full of faith. By full of faith, meaning that it fills, up, fills us up so that there is no room for doubt. And there is no room for fear because our confidence is not in man. Our confidence is in the Lord who loved us and gave himself for us. He doesn't want us to be people of doubt and fear. He, want us, he wants us to be full of faith. He doesn't want us to make room for a lot of doubt. He wants us to be so full of faith that it exudes from us as confidence. Faith should fill our minds. That means you've got to, well, how do you get that? Well, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. So how are you going to get that kind of, well, you've got to be a Bible student. You've got to be a student of the Bible. That you can miss a lot of things in this world, but one thing you can't miss it's your time to study God's word and build up your faith on a personal basis. Don't wait to Wednesday night and Sunday. This is what you do because you're exercising your faith and it's yours. It's a faith that fills your mind with confidence in Jesus Christ. It fills your emotions and your heart and your will to live and to and to keep moving forward and keep pressing on. That's the kind of faith that is full, that fills you. And that's what we need, is to be people who are full of faith, so full that it flows out in all directions. The people that you, uh, who live around you, who work with you, do they know that you're a Christian? Are you full of faith so that it exudes in your attitude, your outlook? Did people say, well, how do you deal with things like you deal with? And you say, well, I, I, just, I just believe the Lord. I believe his promises. And I believe he'll help me through the tests and the trials. Does it flow out in all directions? I know it does in some But I want it to be in every one of us. It needs to flow out in the words you choose to use and the words you choose not to use. It needs to flow out in the behavior and the actions you take. It needs to be flowing out in the words the testimony of your faith. Things that you talk about that says to others... They do that because they believe in this Jesus. And maybe I need to study about this Jesus. We need to be full of faith. Well, back to our text in Hebrews 10. Look, look at that one more time. Hebrews 10, verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus... Do we have boldness because Jesus gives us that boldness? It's a new and it's a living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. He opened a way by spilling his blood. A way for you to have that blood so that you can enter into his presence. 
And you not only have the opening of that, that new and living way for you to enter through his flesh. But you have a high priest over the house of God. And since you have that, he says in verse 22, then let us draw near. Now, if you don't exercise more than just a little faith, you're not going to draw near. But draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. So when we're doubting, we're not full of assurance. And our faith is lacking something. And we need to make sure that we are taking advantage with, uh, with all of our strength and mind of the things that he's provided for us so that we can have what he wants us to have, and that is full assurance of faith. You see, this, belief, this faith believes in the truth of Jesus, and therefore is, is built on a rock. It's got a good solid foundation underneath it. It believes in the mercy and grace of Jesus, that he came to save sinners, and I'm one of them that he came to save. And you're one of them. And you believe that his mercy and grace is for you. And it fully trusts the provisions of Jesus. A way to be forgiven. A way to get right with God. A way to have hope of heaven. And all of that translates into assurance. There should not be Christians walking around full of doubt and fear and anxiety and worry when we're anchored in Jesus Christ. So our question has been through this lesson, where are you now? Where are you in these levels of faith? What are you filling yourself with? Is there a lot of emptiness and a little faith there? A lot of worry and fear and a little bit of faith at the bottom of all of that? Or does it rise to push all of the doubts and fears and anxiety away so that you're full of assurance of faith? Well, that's what the Lord wants. He doesn't want our faith to stay small. And if we let it stay there, brethren, we're wasting our time. We do not need to be wasting our time nor the Lord's time. We do not need to let Jesus die for nothing. And if we let him die for nothing in our case, then we're not only letting him down, we're letting ourselves down and we're letting others down by our influence. We need to make sure that we're growing and developing into that full assurance of faith. If you want to get started this morning, this evening, and you have never obeyed the gospel of Christ... Do you need to study the evidence? Give yourself a good, strong foundation. We'll be happy to study with you. You need a good foundation. If you're already on that foundation, you do believe that he is the Christ, the son of the living God, but you haven't repented of sins, then what's what's holding you back? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you've done that and you've fallen because you did not allow your faith to grow, you did not keep supplying it so that it kept growing and developing, and you need to correct things in a public way and we can help you in any way, please don't harden your heart. Come now as we stand together and sing this song.